These stairs are always referred to as the melting stairs or the melted stairs. People speculate that there's a lot of interesting things going on them, and maybe they were melted. Hey, what's up everybody? NEXT here, and this is the Adept Expeditions YouTube channel. And if you are anything like me, and you feel a calling to research ancient civilizations, and have a deep desire for exploring esoteric mysteries, then you will love what I have in store for this channel. So please, take a moment now, hit the subscribe button, and also be sure to hit the bell icon. By doing so, you will not only stay on the cutting edge with updates, but also help support the growth of this channel, enabling me to continue making videos like this one. In this video, we take a closer look at one of Dendara's most enduring mysteries, the so-called Melted Steps. This is the ascending, spiraling western staircase that leads to the ceiling of the Hetor Temple of Dendara. At a glance, one receives the impression that the stairs have been melted. Sensational stories, ranging from nuclear blasts to corrosive liquid spills, have all attempted to explain this bizarre anomaly. In 2018, Erica Mermousse uploaded a video to her YouTube channel with Egyptian tour guide Mohamed Ibrahim. The guide's explanation prompted a reaction and response from ancient mysteries researcher Dr. Charles Koss, who explored this topic on his entertaining YouTube channel, to which I'll leave a link for you in the description below. Dr. Koss suggested that this effect may be the product of a process similar to how stalagmites are formed. He believes water seepage, carrying calcium carbonate, dripped into pools on the indented steps, gradually reconstituting the stone, giving us the melted look that we see today. While I personally found this explanation to be more reasonable than a nuclear blast, unfortunately we don't get a good view of the ceiling in his video, which draws mostly from still images of only one flight of stairs. So I thought it would be beneficial to add to the record here on YouTube by sharing some of my original video footage, documenting not only the ceiling, but also detailing each and every step up close from various angles. I recently posted the whole uninterrupted detail up the staircase to my Patreon page for my Patreon supporters. You can gain access to that and more exclusive content not available here on my YouTube channel by becoming an adept contributor on my Patreon page. All donations at any tier are appreciated. However, I will be sharing some of the footage with you here in this video. I also brought in Susan Moore, a qualified geologist to explain the mysterious melted staircase inside the Hathor Temple of Dendera. Now, if you are already familiar with Brian Forrester, you may also know that Susan Moore has been his go-to resident geologist. And if you watch videos with Yusef Ayawan from Kemet School, you often hear him attributing his knowledge of different stone types to his teacher, geologist Susan Moore. So in this video, rather than relying solely on tour guides, we can hear from a professional geologist. The mystery of the melted staircase is mind-boggling. It's one that still puzzles scholars today. Was it the result of foot traffic? This is the usual explanation. But if so, then why do we see such buildup? Why does it appear to be melted or overflowing like a puddle of stone? Was it melted by heat, solar bursts, corrosive liquids, or could it even be geopolymer? Who, what, when, how, and why will be taking a closer look in this video. Resting on the desert border, some 60 miles south of Abydos and 30 miles north of Luxor, is the impressive Hathor Temple of Dendara a major tourist attraction. It is one of the best preserved temples in all of Egypt, known not only for its well-preserved architecture, but also its well-preserved secrets. Unlike most temples, it does not have the traditional massive pylon and portal at its entrance. Instead, a solitary towering gate, built under the reign of Roman Emperor Domitian between 81 and 96 AD. While standing under the underbelly of the propylon, the so-called indigenous wisdom keeper, Abdel Hakim Ayawan, would tell tourists that this was a place of secrets. Okay, everybody look up. There is a pepper the scarab beetle, but it's the underside. And I've been told there are other places, but Hakim said this is one of the only rare places in Egypt you see the underside of the scarab beetle. Why? It means secrets are revealed in this temple. Take your pictures. 
It certainly is an unusual place. From here, we make our entrance into the ruined courtyard where we are confronted with the main temple and its unique six-column facade. The present temple is nearly 2,200 years old, with construction beginning in the first century BC under the late Ptolemies. They were originally Greek interlopers after Persian rule, already far removed from the last of the native Egyptian rulers by hundreds of years. This is important to keep in mind because when we think of this temple and its mysteries, such as the melted stairs or the zodiac or even the so-called light bulb, which I'll cover in a future video, we think of it as purely the product of ancient Egypt, when in fact the temple was built under Greek and Roman rule during the decline of the Egyptian civilization, during a time when the ability to embody the doctrine and the high wisdom of the ancient Egyptians was already waning. It was built to an older blueprint from antiquity, and there is a case to be made for just how much influence the native Egyptians actually held during the late Ptolemaic times. But this temple, bait, the money was paid by the Greeks and Romans, mm -hmm. workers were, were Egyptians and Rome, Greeks and Romans, mm -hmm. but the wisdom is ancient Egyptian. Mm -hmm. The stairs in question were used by the initiated priesthood during ceremonial processions as depicted on the walls. The initiates would purify in the sacred lake before entering the temple, likely wearing sandals as depicted in the relief and perhaps drenched in ceremonial oils. The temple was active in this way for only a couple hundred years. Fellahin and nomadic settlers seeking refuge gradually occupied the temple as a shelter, taking cover under its extensive roof. While the casual tourist may traverse over these stairs without even noticing, the more adept tour leaders, adequately acquainted with this temple, will make a point to call attention to this anomaly. It continues to perplex the minds of many, leading to much speculation. Unlike other temples, we can access all three levels, including the crypts below. In fact, they just recently opened another crypt at Dendara to the general public just this year. And we'll be taking a look at that crypt on my next tour of Egypt this September. And also, it is the only place, the only temple, I mean, that we can go underneath the temple. and on the roof of the temple. Every temple was always three stories and sometimes four stories underground, the seven. Four and, and three, you will make the seven. So it is the only one because the other temples, the ceiling is not stable or they close it for a reason, but this is the only one we can see the ceiling, the roof. The temple at Dendara is consecrated to Hathor, pronounced Heter in Egyptian, meaning the house of Horus, or in ancient terms, the house of Heru. The netter or principal Hathor, usually depicted as a human body but with the ears, horns, and head of a cow, is widely recognized as the goddess of pleasure, love, dance, and joy. The uninitiated have misinterpreted the symbolism attributed to the principal of Hathor as an image depicting a terrible solar event. But this is indeed a misunderstanding, for the principal in her cosmic role as mistress of the cycles of time mother of the universe and the feminine force of nourishment. I will explain the symbolism in a future video. The temple facade is formed by the front row of four identical rows of massive Hathor headed columns with capitals in the shape of sistrums, a kind of musical instrument associated with Hathor and symbolic of joy and celebration. It was at Dendaro where the Egyptian New Year was celebrated and the theme of revelry and noisemaking on New Year's Eve may be traced back at least this far. This is true. I mean, Hathor, or Hathor, I call him the Egyptian name. Hathor was, was not only Greeks associated her with Aphrodite, which is absolutely correct, um, song, dance, sex, music, but also with the, with the passage, the cycles of time, and astronomy and all of these things, it was here that the new year was celebrated, and we'll go through all of that when we regroup. So this is a real, uh, this is a real treat. The lower portion of the front row of the column is unusual. It is screened in, creating the facade and enclosed space behind the vestibule. Why Hathor was the only deity to ever receive a column capital is a mystery but the deeper mysteries lie within the temple itself, and the mysteries here are many-fold. So let's go inside and take a look at the so-called melted steps 
and see how geologist Susan Moore explains this effect. These stairs are always referred to as the melting stairs or the melted stairs, and maybe that is one possibility that might have happened. But if you consider the weathering of rock over years, that might be another idea that could be used. When I was in the Cairo Museum the other day, I noticed that the limestone stairs were already getting cupped and, and divoted from people walking up and down them, and that was 100 years. These stairs were built 2,000 years ago, so that's 2,000 years of people walking up and down these stairs. That could be another possibility. So there you have it. Now this is also the usual explanation, that the depressions, divots, or indentations in the steps are caused from foot traffic, like we see elsewhere, and I'm not denying that. But this does not explain, at least not sufficiently, the net buildup of material on some of the steps, which often goes ignored by proponents of the foot traffic theory. But this buildup does exist. So the geologist's explanation, in my opinion, is insufficient. It provided us with no considerable empirical evidence to support her argument. And it's really no different than observations and explanations given by general tour guides. I just can't understand why the buildup is often ignored in favor of the depressions from foot traffic. It's almost like a sleight of hand trick. I've been there in person many times, and I can tell you that this buildup exists. The stairs certainly have this raised net buildup of material. As you can see, when I get down low with the camera angle, the effect of the buildup is not an optical illusion or a function of camera angle and perspective. Now, can sandstone dissolve? Absolutely. Could it reconstitute? Probably, but this is what I'd like to see from a geologist, an explanation for the process of the net buildup that we see on the stairs. Now, we call them the melted stairs, and so there's some alternative theories that go along with this. This whole idea of melting is likely wrong. To melt the sandstone step, it would require extreme heat, which is well beyond the temperature characteristic of this region. Some have suggested a solar event or outburst is responsible, such as a coronal mass ejection. When a CME strikes Earth's atmosphere, it causes disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field, creating a geomagnetic storm. Solar storms have a power to black out entire cities, even regions, but this affects our technology, not so much our structures. It would have to travel directly through the light aperture, which shows no signs of damage, and it doesn't account for the wear pattern to any of the steps above the specific landing or flight. So, in order to damage the steps above the level of the aperture, it would have to navigate precisely through the rooftop entrance and miraculously maneuver nine right turn corners, doing no damage at all to the walls or ceiling. So it is highly unlikely that this damage to the steps is due to a solar event or a nuclear blast as some have suggested. This idea of a nuclear blast is just silly to conjecture. If it was nuclear, we would see much more damage. Another alternative theory is that this is the result of a single clumsy spill of some magical sauce. Yes, alchemy finds roots in Egypt, and within the Hippostyle Hall is a chamber designated as a perfume laboratory. But here, I agree with the geologist. See, if you were melting something down here, it would come running all the way down there before it switched around. As the geologist has shown, if it were a spillage, gravity would likely carry the corrosive liquid into the wall. A corrosive liquid isn't going to perfectly navigate all the right angle turns. One of the potential possibilities that often goes overlooked here is the case for geopolymer, though I'm not certain that's the case here either. Perhaps a spill broke the mold, giving us that flowy puddle of stone look. Generally speaking, we have tool marks and quarries, so we know stones were indeed carved, at least in tandem with geopolymer, if not exclusively. Personally, I do think geopolymer theory has some legs in some cases, but I feel it would be more of a chemical or resonant based, not so much heat. 
And then we have to consider that these steps were commissioned by Greeks and Romans at the end of what we know as the Egyptian civilization. So then, geopolymer wouldn't have been a lost technique known only to the ancient ancients, but still in use around the time of Christ. I will do a more in-depth video on geopolymer in the near future. I think it's potentially possible, and I haven't ruled out geopolymer just yet, but instinctually, I don't think that's the case, as I do believe that it's sandstone, like most of the temple. Another thing to keep in mind is that the steps outside, on the roof, show similar wear patterns. So spillage into the temple and all the way down, isolating damage only to the steps in the middle, is really unlikely. I think it's more likely to be a geological process. It's more than possible that the so-called melt might be naturally occurring stalagmite formation, possibly even in the presence of a naturally occurring electrochemical gradient, which could facilitate the process. It is even possible, I think, that what may have occurred is that there was a natural depression made by thousands of footsteps and it then a repair was made, but the repair itself may have melted. Dr. Charles Kors compares this anomaly that we see to a stalagmite and thinks the melted appearance could be the result of calcium carbonate dripping from the ceiling. This is a reasonable explanation, but we never see the ceiling in his video. So here's my footage. We can see the ceiling is pretty dark and moldy. It's hard to make anything out from this specific footage, but I will be paying closer attention to the ceiling and involving expedition members of my next intensive study trip. And you can join this tour if you like. To learn more, visit adeptexpeditions.com. We do know that it was the smoke from centuries of fires lit below the ceilings that blacken the astronomical and astrological reliefs that have just recently been fully restored to its original color. Even the Dendara Zodiac was blackened before it was taken by foreigners and replaced with a blackened replica. I do like the comparison to a stalagmite, but just like in a cave, if a stalagmite is touched, the process dies and it comes to a halt. It would require a persistent, uninterrupted source of moisture, seeping, not running. But the problem here is that the temple is no more than 2200 years old, and it's likely experienced heavy occupation throughout its history. That sort of foot traffic would not allow for such a condition to form. Further, mounds of sand came between the steps and ceiling. As when Napoleon arrived at Dendara, he found the temple more than half filled with sand. For this geological process to make more sense, we would have to see clear evidence of persistent seepage or leakage from above. But I really can't imagine what persistent water source that would be. In the interest of fairness, and this isn't a well-known fact, but there was a whole village of Fellahin and nomadic settlers that had once built on top of the roof of the Dendera temple. But the ancient Egyptians didn't have leaky toilets, and without any evidence of persistent leakage, we can't take this idea any further. And personally, I'm just not convinced that it would travel from floor to floor only settling in the middle of these steps. We also have to consider that there is a landing above, and we see no evidence on this upper flight to support persistent seepage. So I feel like this isn't the proper explanation, but by thinking in terms of a geological process, we may be on the right track. As I do think it could be a matter of environment, such as moisture accumulation, somehow taking shape or coalescing in a way that the layer on the steps congealed into a raised net material, giving us the appearance of a raised puddle of stone on the already indented step. But again, I'd like to hear from a geologist or even a physicist to explain how this process applies to this situation. Another explanation suggests that this effect is the result of some flooding or water damage, but there is no evidence of water erosion or flooding inside the temple, nor has it rained that much in Egypt after this temple was built some 2,200 years ago. I have spoke with another geologist about this idea, and he agrees that the sediment would not accumulate at the bottom of each step because the water would have washed it all away to the bottom. Hey Matt, you have a master's in geology, so what's your take on this idea that water had flooded through the Dendera Temple? Well, at the bottom of each step, there's a buildup of sediment. If water was washing it in, the sediment would have gone all the way to the bottom of the staircase. So if we found a buildup of sediment at the bottom, this idea might work, but we don't see this. 
There are plenty of truly strange things in Egypt that are without explanation, but certainly, this doesn't have to be one of them. To arrive at a proper explanation, all we really have to do is conduct a simple scientific experiment. One could take a sample of the already deteriorating step and compare it to a sample of the so-called melted part. If it's from depositing or calcifying, it will be a different material altogether. Or, it may show as being the same minerals exactly. Or, it may show as being a transformed mineral. In any case, any one of these results would bring us closer to a true answer. Convincing the authorities to scoop a sample out of the staircase is entirely another subject. But hypothetically speaking, the samples only need to be a small scoop, the steps are already deteriorating anyway, and the authorities didn't think twice about destroying the walls to install this modern pipework into the ancient structure. Until those samples are taken and analyzed, I really don't know. I will be looking for further evidence on the ceiling during my next group tour with Adept Expeditions, and I'll leave a link below in case you'd like to join us. One of the questions that we have to ask is if this effect is obvious elsewhere. We do see worn steps elsewhere, but what about the raised surface? Upstairs, on the exterior of the chamber that holds the Dendara Zodiac, we can see the fishnet looking markings on the original stone, and what appears to be a plaster or grout. Could this lend to the geopolymer theory? I admit, I do not know. And even after the geologist's explanation, I am still completely stumped. I have presented all the angles, and I invite you, the audience, to contemplate and weigh in with your own thoughts in the comments section below. Keep in mind that, from a geological perspective, stone is essentially a liquid. From an esoteric point of view, stone is not an object. It is a process. The entire universe is permeated by a vibratory energy. In some mystical traditions, such as the Rosicrucian tradition, it is called spirit. Students of mysticism have long understood that our material world is shaped by the way our objective consciousness perceives the vibrational frequencies emanating from the material world, and that perception is influenced by compelling forces such as our beliefs, the programming of our culture, and the prevailing academic theories of our day. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this video here on my Adept Expeditions YouTube channel, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment with your thoughts below. I'd be curious to know what you think. I also recently set up my Patreon, and I could really use your support as I'm trying to now do this full time. I've made best efforts to put together some really cool benefits for various tiers on my Patreon page. You can learn more about that at patreon.com forward slash N-E-X-T, and I'll leave a link for that in the description below. If you're interested in seeing Dendara in person, you can join me for my next study trip of Egypt at adeptexpeditions.com. Until next time, NEXT signing out.